big honor to welcome you to this first session at the Friday morning, pre-implant disease reloaded, immune responses, cellular, crosstalk, and microbiome. We all know that some patients are more susceptible to pre-implant diseases than others. But in order to allow for a targeted therapy, we may ask ourselves how we can identify these patients. And we still have inconclusive evidence what is the role of the microbiome of patient-specific immunological factors and which role play novel technologies for the future to give us a chance to provide maybe better treatments to our patients. Yeah, well, and we're here and you're here, obviously, because you're really interested in it. Because uh, after such a very night, very successful night yesterday, it's very heavy to stand up and show up in time to, to, to know the really news about periodontitis. And just guess you're coming back to your office on Monday and there is a patient waiting to be treated and you see that there is a breakdown in the bone and you see there is a pocket depth increase and you see there is bleeding on prodding, uh, bleeding on probing. Are you still on the, on the front line of treatment options? Do you know really what's periimplantitis? Do you ne really know what's pathogenesis? Are there news? Are there new treatment methods we, you could use on the patient? So what we try to answer this morning session is, am I up to date? What can I take home? What is the message? What should I do in my daily treatment planning so that, that I'm really on the front line of, 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 of treatment? So, Katrin, the first yeah, speaker first, that will answer this question. Yes, yeah, Professor Tobias Fredwurst from the University of Freiburg. Tobias, please. So, Tobias. Fred Wurz is professor and oral surgeon at the Department of Oral and Craniofaxillofacial Surgery at the University Hospital of Freiburg in Germany. He served as an osteology research scholar in Michigan, is also a visiting professor at the University of Harvard. And we are very much looking forward to see what he can say um, upon the pathogenesis and um, immune reaction or proteomics and how they may help us in the future to better understand pre-implant diseases and the diagnostics. So Tobias, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks, Katrin. Thanks, Robert, for your kind introduction. Dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here on the big stage. Special thanks to the Congress presidents for inviting me, for having me here today. And as Katrin already mentioned, I want to talk with you about the pathogenesis. And we have a really nice session with uh, Asaf and Daniel. And I think you can look forward to it, to a nice morning. So I will focus on the immunology. I will make it simple and I, I hope uh, interesting enough that you stay awake like Robert mentioned. So since I'm the first speaker in the morning, I have the pleasure uh, to show the ideology slides. And we all know peri-implant disease is multifactorial. We have the best evidence for a plug association. And um, Daniel, you will cover that. Um, but in the recent years, several other factors which may influence the peri-implant bone loss around implants have been introduced with different um, yeah, evidence on that, like uh, iron particle release, occlusal overloading. But you see, there are a lot of question marks on that. And I thought about my talk um, about an analogy or an image for our patients, for our peri-implant patient. I came what came to my mind are coffee machines. So there was a nice study 10 years ago, and they looked on different coffee machines and wanted to discriminate the microbiome. So all bacteria which are on your or my coffee machines. You see here different coffee machines, a sensor, CityZ, and Zincia. Maybe you have one of them. And it's not a silly study. They wanted to know how caffeine is anti-effective. So it was not just a funny story. Um, and you see here all the bacteria. The blue ones are different bacteria species. And what they found is from coffee machine to coffee machine, we have different bacteria species on it. And it depends where we're taking the samples from. So are we taking the samples from the top, from the bottom, there where your empty cups are in? And exactly this is the same for our peri-implant patients. And it's in the microbiome, it's in the immunology, and if you take one picture home, then it's a coffee machine 
um, and that is my claim here. So the microbiome, I don't want to take anything of your topic, Daniel. So the microbiome, there was a landmark study 10 years ago from Dadoop and JDR. And they did the same analysis like the coffee machine guys I showed you before, even the same uh, sequencing method. They included 81 patients, they were indentulous, and they had healthy tooth, diseased tooth, periodontitis, healthy implants, and diseased implants in the same cavity. 81 patients, and you see the diagram on the left side, this is one patient. It's a profile of the microbiome of one patient. And what they found is then in 65% of all the patients, of the 81 patients, they share less than 50% of the bacterial species. What does it mean? Coffee machines. Different patients, different microbiomes, different species. That's a problem for us because we try to find specific species which are in peri-implant disease to use them for diagnostics, for therapy modulation. So i give you an example if we would know, okay, this bacteria in there, we can modify our antibiotics. We know that in, peridon in, in peri-implantitis, there are some periodontal pathogens visible, but not in every patient. So this difference is the problem we have all are facing all in our private practices. And the disease is complex. Uh, we have a high complexity. I just talked in the last one or two slides about the bacteria, but we have iron and particles over there. We don't know exactly what they are doing there, and as of you will cover this maybe a little bit. And we have a big part in this disease, and this is the immunology, the immune cells you are seeing over there. And actually, Berglund and co-workers did the first study some years ago, a decade ago, but we neglected a little bit the immunology in the, in the research of the last 10 years. And so that's why uh, in Freiburg we decided to dive deeper into, into that research topic. And that is the next 50 minutes I want to share with you. So what did we do? I, I brought a study from us with me. Here you see two patients out of the study. They have severe peri-implant disease, and we included patients with titanium implants and patients with ceramic implants. So we in the craniomaxillofacial surgery department in Freiburg are not placing a lot of ceramic implants. That kind of ceramic implants were placed by Ralf Kohl and Benedikt Spies in our PROS department, and they gave me the periimplantitis samples from that patients because they are really rare because, we are, as you all know, ceramic implants are still not the biggest amount of implants we are placing. We included patients with more than 50% of bone loss, so really severe peri-implant disease and the indication for implant removal. What did we do exactly? So we included all the patients. They had already the severe disease, and then um, they had all more than 50% bone loss, and we want to remove the implants. Before we are doing this, we are obtaining the soft tissue. You all know what we shall do according to the guidelines to remove the soft tissue. And this soft tissue is the inflammation around the implants. There are the immune cells. There are parts of the bacteria. There are the iron and particles. So we removed this tissue and looked into it, into the immunology. We did different stainings. And I think this is the point on a Friday morning where I would say, okay, I stopped listening to him. Now it's get too complicated, but please follow me. That's the interesting part. So here we did immunology staining for the titanium implants. And you see B and T lymphocytes, macrophages, plasma cells. So the main cells of immunology um, in humans and in, in animals as well. And all the uh, brown dots you can see, this is one cell. One brown dot on the right panel, it's a plasma cell. So we did this for the titanium samples, and we did this for the ceramic samples you see here on the bottom. And what you can see with the naked eye, and we did uh, histology and we did statistics, we haven't seen big differences between both materials. That was surprising. It's on the late state of, of the disease, and we don't, see, uh, we don't see any differences between titanium and the ceramic implants. We were a little bit disappointed because this is not a nice claim for a research study, no differences. 
and everyone is aiming for nice uh, results for ceramic implants and, and so on and so on. But we look deeper into it and we find a really interesting uh, fact. I will show you on this slide. These are two of the patients out of our study. On the left hand is a patient, his immune, immune uh, panel, and on the right hand is another patient. On the left one, you see plenty of macrophages, the brown dots. On the right hand side, you see almost no macrophages. Both with severe periimplant disease, more than 50% of bone loss. And that is interesting because from patient to patient, we see different immune reaction at the same stage of the disease or how we are defining the disease at that point according to what Robert mentioned, um, probing death and bleeding on probing and maybe x-rays. Coffee machines. Patients are different from patient to patient. We see a different microbiome. We see, see a different immunome, different immunological cells. Is it surprising? Actually not. Because if we are looking into it, we see this in other studies in humans as well, and I will show you in a few slides. Here is the statistic of it. You see our patient, it was a quite small patient cohort, seven titanium periimplant disease, eight ceramic periimplant disease patients, and you see the immune panels. I will go into it because maybe it's a little bit confusing. Let's look into one of our patients. It could be your patient. Patient number one. He has 70% plasma cells and almost no macrophages. Maybe that was the guy I showed you the slide before on the right side. Show you another patient, severe periimplant disease, patient number three. He has 30% macrophages, 30% plasma cells, 30% lymphocytes. Completely different immune reaction. And so, um, we looked into some reviews in Nature and Immunology, and this is already known because patients are so different in their immune system. And we know this from our blood works. If you do blood samples from your patient, you see always a range like leukocytes or thrombocytes and so on. And in this range, he is healthy or not, but the healthy range is quite big, as you know. And that is what we see in humans in general. So, for instance, if you look to the total T cells on the right, on the right panel, you see the majority have a 75% distribution, but some have 90% and some have 13% popul population of that population. So, I want to summarize to this point here. The microbiome is quite unspecific. It changes from patient to patient. The immunome, the immune cells, is quite into individual difference, uh, different. It changed from patient to patient, like the coffee machines. Now we thought, okay, but we want to know how we can do better diagnostics, better therapy, go on to the way to personalized implant dentistry. And we looked into periodontics, and there they're doing since 20, 30 years curri curricular fluid analysis with paper strips. Maybe you are familiar with that. So we can in, um, place paper strips into the sulcus and then obtain the curricular fluid. It's not saliva, it shouldn't be blood. It's like a, yeah, like a secretion from the inflammation tissue I just showed you. And all the immune markers are inside. So you know this and uh, studies focused on that, on that marker. Maybe one of you know them, maybe some not. It's interleukin-1-alpha, interleukin-1-beta, so pro, anti-inflammatory cytokines, MMP8s, MMP9s, and even tests are available for it. Maybe you know the MMP8 test. Uh, there are other tests they tried, but often the sensitivity and the specificity is not high enough. So we cannot use it to determine other therapy or other diagnostics. Why is it like this? This is MMP8, it's in the curricular fluid, it's one protein. In this curricular fluid, there are thousands of proteins. Um, I can say it's around about three to 4,000 proteins because we measured it, I will show you in a few slides. So the picture is not this, the picture is like this. These are all the protein which are inside. And what we did the last 10 to 20 years in periodontal peridont, research, we tried to find the Nadel im Heuhaufen, so the needle in the haystack. 
That is what we tried if we choose MMP8 or interleukin 1-alpha or whatever. But if we have differences from patient to patient, from the microbiome to the immunome, what did you estimate? So we have to screen the entire haystack to get any results out of it. And in Freiburg, we did that uh, in the last two to three years, and we published the study on that. So what we did is we obtained the curricular fluid with the paper strips on patients with at least one healthy implant, one diseased implant, and one healthy tooth to get an impression of the immunology of that patient. And then we uh, established a special protocol to get the proteins, all the proteins, out of the curricular fluid. One of my doctoral students did that. And then we did a proteomic analysis. It's like next generation sequencing, a high end approach where we use mass spectrometry. Why now? Because now it's affordable. Several years ago, such an analysis of one sample cost more than two to three thousand euros. Now it's less than one thousand euros. It's like genomics analysis. It's affordable, and that's why we can use it. What do you think? What did we find out? We found thousands of proteins, yes. And what did we find? Different coffee machines, for sure, because we see different bacteria, we see different immune cells, and we see from patient to patient different proteins. So you see on the right left panel, the first column, every line is a protein, every line. It's like a barcode you had on your EAO badge. Every line is a protein, and if, it's a, if a protein is high secreted, it's red, and if it's low, it's blue, like a heat map. It's like a heat map. And you see different protein profiles from patient to patient. On the left hand, the, the gray bar shows these are the healthy perimplant disease patients, and on the, red, uh, on the right side, you see the perimplant titus patients. So, inter-individual differences, okay, we showed this, but we, sh we find something more interesting, because we find for the first time clusters which are typical for peri-implant disease and typical for healthy implants. And you see it here, all the blue dots are specific proteins which are um, higher secreted in peri-implant disease in comparison to the healthy parts. And we can define some of the proteins, and so this is the first time in implant research that we see specific patterns, despite the inter-individual differences. So what is the clue out of this? So we can use this now, we are on the first step for better diagnostics, for better therapy modulation, and for monitoring. This is what everyone is claiming like precision or uh, precise or personalized dentistry. We are here on the first step. And we can use something else because everyone is saying, okay, we need AI, KI, and so on. We can use this data um, and uh, use specific algorithm, and we did that, it's a go enrichment analysis, to use the proteins and, say, and define which biological pathways are activated in our patients. And you see here all the peptides and the proteins, and then we use this algorithm and I will zoom in because maybe it's hard to see for you what uh, biological pathways the algorithm shows us. And then we see, okay, we see a immune response in the patient. And so it's good for you, Daniel, that you can come in with the microbiome and the probiotics. But we see also um, like a specific immune, humoral immune response I showed you before with the immune cells or a response to the external stimulus. That's quite in unspecific, but maybe Asaf shed more light on that topic. So that is already uh, the end of my talk. Um, if I wish I, you, you bring one message, take home message home, think about coffee machines. Um, the patients are like coffee machines. They are different in their microbiome. They are different in their immunome. They are different in their proteome. So they are different from patient to patient, but we can use now this data with new analysis to uh, yeah, get a better perspective on that disease. Yeah, I want to thank everyone who helped me to um, do this research, and a lot of the people are here today, and it's really nice to see them and to present the data for you and in your name, and we have a lot of good collaboration because otherwise it's uh, sophisticating to get all this analysis running. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was not too overwhelming 
despite it was immunology, and I'm looking forward to the interview and the next sessions. So thank, thank you very much to peers, and, and obviously we didn't promise you too much. So it's, it's really, you're on the front line listening to, the, to this session now, and, and it's great, and, and, and the most I appreciate, you left us some minutes more for discussion, and, and, and for sure the audience will, will, will go for that. So we ask the next uh, specialist, the specialist, and this is Daniel Jönsson. Daniel got his DDS and PhD at Malmö University. Please come to the stage. And he is postdoc, uh, was postdoc from 2009 to 2010 uh, at the Columbia University Medical Center in New York. He finished his specialist training in periodontics 2014 and was rewarded Associated Professor in Periodontics in 2017, as well as Associated Professor in Internal Medicine Research, which is most appropriate for us now. Today he serves as, as half-time associate professor at Lund University, medical faculty and half-time clinic at the biggest um, dental specialist clinic in um, southern Sweden. So being a specialist, we are very eager to know more about the periimplantitis, which we now know is only the sum of different coffee machines. Yes. <laughs> so we look at a special coffee machine now. Thank you very Please much. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and Daniel Johnson. And uh, as mentioned, I'm associate professor at Lund and Malmö University, particularly Lund nowadays, and uh, doing my clinic half time at Folktamona Skåne. And this beautiful building here is the library in Lund. Uh, so we're here to talk about uh, this. Uh, peri-implant disease and bone loss around the implants. This is a patient from the clinic. He came there in 2011 and uh, didn't get much uh, treatment. He didn't really want to attend the treatments. And 10 years later, it looked like this. And uh, moments after the um, x-rays were taken, the bridge was lifted up. But as you can see here in the middle picture, one of the implants didn't really have a lot of bone loss around it, which is puzzling. So is perimplantitis treatable? Uh, well, according to some of the literature, treatable-ish. Uh, uh, from the prestigious group in Gothenburg, they have shown a uh, for a five years success rate that's uh, about 56%. And another prestigious group of researchers have shown a similar success rate over five years. But as all of the clinicians in here know, there's perimplantitis and there's perimplantitis. Sometimes you walk into the clinic and see the next patient, and you're very pretty happy about this, clin this patient and the surgery that you're going to do. And uh, your prognosis for the treatment is pretty good. But then in the afternoon, you go in and see another perimplantitis patient, and you think to yourself, oh, by God, I wonder how this is going to, turn out, going to turn out. And this is one of the more simple cases. You have a defined bone loss, and you add some bone augmentation. Here's another case. And you can be pretty assured that it's going to be uh, successful. Here is one of the other more tricky patients. Uh, this uh, woman is uh, 80 years old when the x-rays are taken. It's one year ago, so 81 today. Uh, anyways, severe perimplantitis in the upper and the lower jaw. And uh, what can you do, really? I mean, you can do your period surgery. You can slow down the progression. You can lessen the inflammatory burden. But are you going to extract all the implants, do huge bone augmentations on an 81-year-old woman? Probably not, and give her a full denture, removable denture won't make her happier either. So bet behind those low success rates over five years, you have to consider that perimplantitis is very, can be very different. So we're here to talk about the causes of perimplantitis, the immunological versus the bacteria. And of course, you can't have one without the other. 
to really dig into that, uh, you have to go back to the microbiome concept. And what, what is the microbiome concept? Where it's really not that complicated. Uh, this uh, is a graph showing that bacteria has been around for a very, very long time. Bacteria has been around for a billion years, and maybe, according to some researchers, maybe even three billion years. So, and humans have been around for 70,000 years, according to Svante Pabo, a Swedish researcher, Nobel awardee, who's here in Berlin at the Max Planck Institute. Anyways, so for us to, evolution, to go through evolution to the people that we are today, we must coexist with bacteria. They are the bosses, really. And uh, the trick, and I was also going to say, and that day we die, what happens? The bacteria take over and turn us into dust. So the tricky thing about good microbiome research is unfortunately that you need big cohorts. So this is a uh, excellent study where they a review kind of where they show I mean one of the first findings in uh, microbiome research was the association between gut microbiome and BMI. Blame it on the bugs. But Unfortunately, a lot of the studies showed that different species were important in this association. And what this paper shows is that in order to have reproducible data, you need big cohorts. You need cohorts up to 2,000 people. And in periodontal literature, we have some big cohorts, but in perimplantitis, there are none. But I'm going to continue my presentation after showing this slide anyways. So just keep that in mind. This is the big study by Genko and Vaktavsky Vende and colleagues, uh, including 1,200 women in, in, in their study. It's, this is from 2019. There are some good studies with uh, small cohorts as well on perimplantitis. This is one paper uh, with uh, Cristiano Tommaso, that some of you know, and uh, some colleagues in, in, uh, in Italy. And they looked at uh, healthy mucositis and perimplantitis. And what they find is a group of uh, bacteria that are uh, associated with perimplantitis. And are, if you only look at these bugs, you can sort of predict which ones that do have perimplantitis and which ones that do not in uh, machine learning models. So the suspects were Porphyrmonas gingivalis, Porphyrmonas endodontalis, Tenerella forsythia, Fusobacterium nucleatum, uh, Freitibacterium fastidosum, fastidosum, fasti Diosum, Prevotella intermedia, uh, Treponema denticola. And except for the one that I could hardly pronounce, you know the others from the perio literature. And this is a magnificent uh, systemic review. There's uh, quite a few of these. Uh, this one is from 2023 with Mario Sanz and colleagues. And in this meta-analysis, and I must say, this is an excellent meta-analysis, but it does not, uh, you still need those big studies. A meta-analysis cannot replace one big study that have looked at, uh, at uh, the microbiome in, uh, using next generation sequencing. Anyways, so 12 studies, 1,233 participants, and 1,513 implants. And um, they see some uh, uh, bacterial species that are associated with perimplantitis. Staphylococcus epidermis is kind of a skinny hypothesis, but it uh, has been shown that it, it is associated with uh, implant infections in other sites of the body before. Read the paper and the discussion in the paper. But then we have the usual suspects again. Fusobacterium nucleatum, Treponema denticola, Tanerella forsythia, Prevotella intermedia, Porphyrmonas gingivalis. So looking at the data from uh, 
uh, the Genko study. And then I marked the species that have been associated with perimplantitis in yellow. So the question is really, is there a pocket microbiota? Are we looking at kind of the same thing? We talked about these coffee machines before. And it's a, there's always going to be a difference between different perio patients and between different, different perimplantitis patients. And the question is, is are these differences be bigger or how do they correlate with, with each other? What we call the beta diversity. A recent study from Kumar's group uh, showed that uh, implant surface characteristics can have an impact on, on the micro surface microbiome. So that kind of speaks against what I just said, that there's a pocket microbiome. But on the other hand, they didn't really have uh, all that many uh, implants to be able to show, to discriminate between, between the, uh, the implant surfaces fully. And uh, here are two dysbiosis and perimplantitis pa papers. So dysbiosis, what's that? So if you have the microbiome at a healthy stage and then the microbiota at a uh, diseased state, then the shift towards the diseased state, the changes in that microbiota is, are the dysbiotic changes. So we have uh, the paper from Kepschel's group, uh, which is from 2008. Yes, 18, and, uh, and uh, a new paper from uh, a, a group from China that's published in this year. So dysbiosis in the biofilm may indicate the relevance of the biofilm in disease progression. And the severity of perimplantitis lesions correlate with the level of submucosal microbial dysbiosis in both these papers. So what's the hen and the egg? Uh, are the immunological changes that we just heard about, are they the ones that di dictate if you're going to get a dysbiotic microbiome? Uh, or, or is it the microbiota that dictates the immunological changes? Of course it's going to be both. But how does this relate to going back to the clinic? Uh, what do I need to look for? Well, this is a, also from this year. A recent paper on, uh, on uh, having um, uh, supportive care programs and people that have followed supportive care and people who have not. Uh, and um, interestingly, muc uh, mucositis d was not uh, prevented by attending these regular programs, but perimplantitis was. That's probably could also be due to the higher. Uh, more uh, studies included in the perimplantitis uh, forest plot. But anyways, so attending these programs uh, do seem to be protective against developing perimplantitis. That's really important. So why is that then? Well, even if you have an oral lichen or any or, uh, immunological uh, initiated uh, oral lesion, they have, by reducing the biofilm at a site of an oral lesion is important in treating them. You all know that. And maybe perimplantitis is the same. Oral plaque is associated with increased inflammatory tissue response regardless of etiology. So the, <laughs> we really come back to brushing the implants uh, rather than the specific bugs, uh, kind of. So dental plaque accumulation at a site of inflammation is like gasoline on fire. Remember that, you all know that from before, but we seem to forget it in the whole uh, fancy microbiome uh, way of looking at things. I love the microbiome way of looking at things, but still, you, have, you shouldn't forget where the simple treatments and the simple hypothesis. So is dysbiosis a causal factor or an effect of perimplant disease? Well, treating perimplantitis has a low success rate over five years. This kind of speaks against it. And perimplantitis and peri uh, periodontitis and perimplantitis share the majority of 
top dysbiosis associated species. So maybe it's the milieu. And perimplantitis severity is associated with degree of, uh, of dysbiosis and regular supportive treatment is associated with lower odds of peri-implant disease. So that kind of speaks for dysbiosis as a causal factor. And then I turned this one into green, but it could just as well be yellow. Oral plaque is associated with increased inflammatory tissue response, really regardless of etiology. So what we were thinking a few uh, years back is if a shift in microbiome could cause a shift in the disease progression, that would indicate the importance of the microbiome in peri-implant disease. How about probiotics? So what is probiotics? Well, probiotics is adding bacteria, particularly through tablets, because it's usually been, it's mainly been used for he treating the gut microbiome. And uh, the best way and the most efficient way and the way that probiotics has really uh, have, where we ha really have evidence that probiotics uh, works is in uh, diarrhea due to uh, using um, um, antibiotics. But in the probiotics literature, when you really dig into that, you see that there are some people that are more susceptible to probiotics. And in that group, probiotics seems to work for, for more type of, of, of uh, diseases and conditions. So it's really an interesting world. But uh, yeah, so we did this analysis and uh, we did it together with uh, Shariel Sayadust, who's an associate professor in periodontology in uh, Linköping, used to be in Jönköping, and uh, Anders Johansson, who's uh, at the uh, Umeå University. And the focus review question was, do probiotics cause changes in the microbiota at an implant or affect the clinical parameters such as bleeding on probing, pocket depth and bone loss? I'm gonna present the data on, on pocket depth here. And we had 445 pa papers and ended up with four. And uh, this is a bit too small text here, but anyways, uh, this is five studies, but one of the studies had both a, a, a perimplantitis and mucositis uh, cohort, so we had that twice. Uh, stratified it into that, those both. Intervention time was three months, uh, or in three of the cohorts, one month in one of them, and four and a half months in one of them. And when we looked at the effect on uh, pocket, uh, pro probing pocket depth around the implants, which is relevant both in mucositis and in perimplantitis, uh, probiot adding probiotics to your uh, treatment had no beneficial effect. And this is a funnel plot showing that the mean difference was, there were results on, on both sides of the mean difference. Looking into the microbiological findings, all of these studies, some of them are newer and some of them are a bit older, but all of them use qPCR or DNA, DNA checkerboard. One study found a, a lower abundance of pigeon gevalis in the subjects that had been given uh, um, probiotics compared to the placebo group. So why is that then? Why, why does probiotics not have a bigger effect? Can we exclude probiotics? Are we done with probiotics? We don't, we don't go that way any longer. That would be a bit unfortunate because there, uh, what's been used is lactobacillus reuteri. Why? Because it's readily available, of course. But we have some new data from um, uh, Alex group showing that there are uh, species like Streptococcus dentisani that's been isolated from the oral microbiome uh, and uh, maybe using them instead of uh, lactobacilli would show different results. I don't know, of course, but it's, it's definitely something that needs to be looked at more closely. Uh, 
And there's also the question of uh, administration mode. How do you administer the, the uh, probiotics? Sucking on a tablet will only get you that far, and it will probably affect the gut microbiome more than the oral microbiome. Here's a paper, they did, this is not a probiotics paper, but it does show that you can administer uh, drugs through, through healing abutments as well, and maybe that's better to do that in the implant, perimplantitis patients. And then you have the aspect that, yeah, but the patient wants to have the crown in place and everything, yeah, but the, if the other treatment option is to remove the implant, then maybe they can have a healing abutment for a, for a few months. So uh, concluding, I've been talking faster than I did when uh, going through this before, but uh, anyways, probiotic, uh, periodontitis and perimplantitis share majority of top dysbiosis associated species. I I do believe that this is very interesting, and it's, I know it's a bit provocative to say that it's a pocket microbiome more than anything else, but at the same time, please prove me wrong. There are, of course, certain species that have been associated with, with uh, perimplantitis and not with periodontitis, but the majority of them have. Adding probiotics to perimplantitis treatment does not have any bef beneficial effect on mucositis or perimplantitis, as of now. And probiotics does not affect the microbiological composition at perimplantitis sites, and choosing a different species or a different administration may change or improve the impact of, uh, of probiotics. And published probiotic studies do not promote the importance of the implant biofilm in perimplant disease. However, it's still a very bad idea to put gasoline on fire. So going back to what I said with the, with the um, uh, oral lesions, if you have an inflammation, if it's immunological, immunologically initiated, if it's initiated by small people from out of space, I don't care where it's initiated, but having plaque at that site will ignite the inflammatory response, no matter what. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, now it's my big honor to introduce our next speaker, Asaf Velensky. He is an um, associate professor at the Department of Periodontology, Faculty of Dental Medicine at the Hebrew um, University and the Hadassah Medical Center in Jerusalem in Israel. He received his postgraduate degree in periodontology and EFP um, and um, received the accreditation in 2008 and 2011. He has also a PhD in our immunology from the same university. And his research focused on the pathogenesis of peri-implant diseases. So now we are very interested to see if there is more than the bacterial infection. And we welcome you on the stage and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Tobias and Daniel and uh, today I'm going to talk in the next uh, 20 minutes about the data we have generated in the last years regarding dental implants and the pathogenesis of peri-implantitis. So peri-implantitis, I guess all of you have seen it, but although a lot was written about the disease, we as clinicians are still standing almost helpless against it probably because of the unclear pathogenesis. Dismissing piece of information 
is the major reason why we don't have an efficient treatment with a good prognosis and why we still treat peri-implantitis almost the same way <coughs> sorry, we treat periodontitis. So usually the pathogenesis of diseases is studied using small animals models. And then we go to big animals or to human trials. In this case, we did not have a good model for dental implants in mice. And since large animals are very expensive and human trials have ethical limitations, it was very difficult to study the pathogenesis of peri-implantitis. This is why we decided a few years ago to develop a model for dental implants in mice with the help of MIS, which manufactured the micro-implants for us. In this model, we extract the upper left molars, then wait four weeks for the bone to heal and insert the micro-implants. On the bottom, you see the heads of the two implants relative to a probe and to the contralateral molars. So using this model, we demonstrated that titanium impaired the development of dendritic cells into Langerhans cells that reside in the epithelium because of decreased levels of uh, TGF beta 1 in the epithelium. Here you can see the epithelium that we separated from around teeth and around implants. Langerhans cells are stained in green, and you can see that they are abundant around the teeth compared to their almost absence around implants. And of course, we validated these results using flow cytometry. As you can see in these plots and in this graph, the frequency of Langerhans cells around the implants was lower than their frequency around teeth. So this decrease in Langerhans cells is very significant since Langerhans cells are the main sentinels of the epithelium. They present antigens to naive T cells and prime them, and they have a critical role in maintaining immune homeostasis. And we know <clears throat> that immune homeostasis equals health. And once the equilibrium is disturbed, pathology could appear. In previous studies we have done, that we have done, we found that depletion of Langerhans cells around teeth led to destructive immunity and severe bone loss. So in light of their importance, we wanted to find out if the absence of Langerhans cells around implants would shift the immune response toward tolerance or toward immune activation and tissue destruction. So for that, we collected the tissue around the implants and around teeth. And using flow cytometry, we characterized the main immune subpopulations. We first evaluated leukocytes and found that they were 50% higher around the implants than around teeth. Neutrophils were six times higher around the implant than around teeth. And remember that because I will talk about neutrophils later. And the same pattern was observed for inflammatory monocytes. Lymphocytes were twice as high around the implants. And the same pattern was observed for all main immune subpopulations of lymphocytes. So taken together, the decreased Langerhans cells around the implants and the influx of immune cells to the tissue around implants indicate an immune dysregulation or the dysregulation of immune homeostasis. So we next wanted to examine the um, expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the tissue and found that all of them were expressed significantly more around implants. So not only do we have an uh, influx of immune cells around the implants, the phenotype of these cells is pro-inflammatory. So we moved on and examined the major players in bone remodeling, Rankel and OPG, and found that Rankel 
was expressed significantly more around implants than around teeth, while OPG was expressed significantly less. Taken together, the Rankel OPG ratio, which considered to be a good indicator for bone loss, was six times higher around implants. So it wasn't a surprise to find gradual bone loss around implants when we evaluated it using micro CT. So to conclude our findings up to here, I've shown you that implant placement results in decreased Langerhans cells. The immune homeostasis was dysregulated by an influx of immune cells on one hand and by higher expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines on the other hand. These two factors lead to an elevation in Rankel OPG ratio and consequently bone loss. So I will tell you a story going over the results in one of our lab meetings. One of my students asked me if I think that implants could affect remote sites. So everyone was quiet for a few seconds, and we all knew what we were going to do next. So to address this question, we harvested splenocytes from implanted mice and non-implanted mice, and evaluated the secretion levels of interferon gamma at steady state. As you can see in this graph, splenocytes from implanted mice secreted more interferon gamma compared to splenocytes from non-implanted mice, indicating that these splenocytes are chronically activated under steady state conditions. So we next wanted to know if implants could affect the contralateral teeth. So now we collected the tissue around teeth in implanted mice and compared it to the teeth in non-implanted mice. Using flow cytometry and real-time PCR, we found that lymphocytes were more abundant in around teeth in implanted mice than around teeth in non-implanted mice. And that was true for Rankel expressing cells, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and Rankel OPG ratio. And this data indicate that implants dysregulate immune homeostasis not only locally, but around remote teeth as well. So when we evaluated bone loss, we found that teeth in implanted mice lost more bone than teeth in non-implanted mice. And think about it. It means that placing implants in mice caused bone loss around remote teeth. And we asked ourselves, what could be the mechanism? Could dental implants affect the oral microbiome? To answer this question, we sample the oral microbiota before implant placement and after implant placement. Looking at the cultivated levels of aerobic and anaerobic bacteria, you can see higher loads, higher bacterial loads following implant placement. Further analysis revealed higher diversity following implant placement and variance, as you can see in the red dots, compared to the green dots. Detailed taxonomic analysis showed us that certain feline families that are related to periodontal disease were more abundant following implant placement, while others that are related to periodontal health decreased following implant placement. And we can conclude that implant placement in mice results in bacterial dysbiosis. So at this stage, we know that implants dysregulate or cause bacterial dysbiosis on one hand and dysregulate the uh, immune response or the immune homeostasis on the other hand. But which one of these two arms is the primary etiological factor for bone loss? Which one is the chicken and which one is the egg? So to answer this question and to dissect the role of microbiota in bone loss around implants, we administered the mice with broad, broad spectrum antibiotic and antifungal treatment in order to neutralize this arm. 
So again, we sampled the oral microbiota before the, our treatment, before implant placement, and four weeks following implant placement. Looking at the cultivated levels of the anaerobic bacteria around teeth, we found a massive reduction, as you can see in these blue triangles. And the same was true for around implants. We evaluated the aerobic bacteria as well and found the same pattern, a massive reduction in bacterial load around teeth and implants following our treatment. And these results validated the effectiveness of our treatment. So again, we collected the tissue around implants and using flow cytometry, we characterized all major immune subpopulations of lymphocytes and found that all of them were reduced following our treatment. However, neutrophils, which belong to the innate immune response, did not respond to our treatment and remained high in the tissue around implants. And I will talk about neutrophils soon. When we evaluated bone loss, we found that around teeth in implanted mice, we found gradual bone loss, as I've shown you before. And the same was true for implants. Again, we found gradual bone loss around the implants. However, our antibiotic treatment prevented bone loss around teeth in implanted mice, but it did not prevent the bone loss around implants. And these results highlight the central role microbiota has in bone loss around teeth, but not around implants where the local immunity has the critical role. And think about it, it maybe, or it might explain why perimplantitis is not responding well to mechanical and antibiotic treatment in opposed to periodontitis. So the data I've shown you up to here were obtained under steady state conditions. And we were interested to know if the uh, dysregulation of immune homeostasis around implants will impact their susceptibility to infection. So we used our previously reported model in which we infect, early infect the mice with P. gingivalis once or three times. When we evaluated bone loss, we found that around teeth, a single infection was not enough to create bone loss or to cause bone loss, and we needed to infect the mice three times. However, around implants, a single infection was enough to induce bone loss demonstrating the higher susceptibility implants have to infection. When we evaluated our flow cytometry results, we found a massive influx of immune cells to the tissue around implants in a model of peri-implantitis as compared to a periodontitis that you see in the black bars. Again, demonstrating the more aggressive and uncontrolled immune response in peri-implantitis. And take a look at the neutrophils. They were 25 times higher around the implants in a model of peri-implantitis than in periodontitis. And remember that were, they were the only immune subpopulation that did not respond to our treatment and remained high in the tissue around implants. So these results regarding neutrophils sparked our interest in lipid mediators of inflammation as a new treatment modality for peri-implantitis, since these mediators have the ability to inhibit the infiltration of neutrophils into sites of inflammation. They attenuate the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the tissue and activate monocytes to a non-inflammatory state. All these results in active termination of chronic inflammation and return to homeostasis. So to evaluate their effectiveness in our model, we administered the mice with resolving D2 during the oral infection and two weeks following the oral infection. When we evaluate our results using flow cytometry, we found that our treatment in the green bars 
prevented the influx of immune cells to the tissue as compared to the treated or to um, uh, the perimplantitis group, the infected non-treated group, as you can see in the red bars. But take a look at the neutrophils and how resolving prevented the influx of neutrophils following the treatment. So when we clinically evaluated the jaws, we found in the perimplantitis group the same craters around the implant that we see in humans. And this is how these craters look like in our micro CT sections. But take a look how resolving prevented completely the bone loss around the implants and prevented the perimplantitis. And this graph shows the entire results validating that uh, resolving prevented bone loss and perimplantitis. So we can conclude that resolving D2 prevented bone loss by modulating the local immunity. To summarize, around teeth, Langerhans cells help to maintain the immune homeostasis between the biofilm and the immune system. This equilibrium prevents bone loss. However, around implants, titanium impaired the development of Langerhans cells. Subsequently, the immune homeostasis is dysregulated by an influx of immune cells into the tissue. These cells secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines that in turn recruit more leukocytes and initiate a vicious cycle. The inflamed tissue promotes bacterial dysbiosis on one hand and activates osteoclasts that facilitate bone loss on the other hand. Our antibiotic treatment around teeth in implanted mice decreased the bacterial load and prevented the gradual bone loss. Around the implants, our antibiotic treatment decreased the inflammatory infiltrate and decreased the bacteria, but it did not prevent the influx of neutrophils, and it did not prevent bone loss around implants, emphasizing that bone loss in each niche involves distinct immunological and microbial mechanisms. Treatment with resolving decreased the inflammatory in infiltrate in the tissue around the implants, prevented the influx of neutrophils, and prevented bone loss. And with that, I would like to thank Oded Hyman, who did most of the hard work as part of his PhD, to the rest of the members in the lab, to my collaborators, Lior Shapira and Avichai Chovav, and to MIS, which manufactured the micro implants for us, and to you for listening. <laughs> So thank you very much, Asaf, and it, it turned out really to be a, a very, very, very interesting morning session, at least to me and I'm sure for you as well, and I'm sure you've gained much more knowledge and much more interesting news uh, than, than in many sessions before. So it's really, you all digged in so much deeply into the material that we have, I think we have to fix it on two major points. The one is what is, what is actually the implant more to be looked at? More like a tooth or more like a foreign body? Which means that we treat the perimplantitis like a tooth, like a periodontitis tooth or more like a foreign body to equalize the foreign body reaction more to a stable one, more to a chronic inflammation like. The second one is, do we have uh, microbiomes? We may look at coffee machines, take different coffee machines, it doesn't matter which one, we're, we're collecting microbiomes and, 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 and that's it and we can't collect a specific type of microbiome that we might use. And the linking part together is how can we use, how, we, how can we treat uh, uh, this disease with proteomes. So um, it's very interesting for you and I want to make this 
open this discussion on what is what is the reaction when we place an implant. It's really amazing that once you place an implant, you influence the tissue and the and the reaction of the of the inflammation response to, to the to the non-treated contralateral site, which means tooth and the, and the soft tissue. So what does this do with, with, with our body? Could you please make it clear? Do you think the implant is to be seen like a tooth or more like a foreign body? What's your opinion? Well, we looked at it in mice, so we, I should be cautious when uh, talking about humans. But in mice, definitely. The, the immune response is completely different around this, <coughs> sorry, and around implants. And you see it in the kind of cells that arrive to the tissue, the cytokines that they uh, uh, produce, and in bone loss. Uh, at the end, the implant is a foreign body, some kind of a foreign body. So the immune response did not evolve to, uh, to respond to it, as in uh, teeth. So I think it... Uh, Implants cause uh, different immune uh, homeostasis around them, which is, is more susceptible, as Daniel has shown, to microbiota. So once you disturb this delicate uh, immune homeostasis, then the pathology could uh, develop. You agree? Yes, I do agree. And there's, um, uh, as the literature shows, uh, both periodontitis and perimplantitis have common a lot of common microbiota. And uh, maybe that shows that a great majority of the microbiota is actually shared due to the pocket environment that we have in both diseases. But at the same time, we have all this neutrophil influx. And for the clinicians, you also know that when you probe around an implant, the res the, you have more, uh, freq you more frequently have pus than you have ar around uh, per in periodontitis. And that also shows that the neutrophils are there. So in many ways, I think Which that means it's more a foreign body. <laughs> <laughs> it's I want different. to fix it. I, I just want to say that it's different. I, yeah. and, and I think that the immunological response around an implant is different. Uh, I don't think that the evidence is really there, there to call it a foreign body reaction, but at least the, 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 the tissue response is different. And we also see in the clinic that, that it's fast. It's faster than around teeth. Uh -huh. uh, and that's why we try to postpone uh, putting in implants in periodontitis patients. But uh, I think that in the resolving... Uh, you, because of the fact that there are so much more neutrophils in perimplantitis, I think that using resolvins uh, rather than uh, antibiotics makes a whole lot of sense. Um, first of all, you agree with... with yeah, so, um, so that you're both pointing in the same direction. I agree also, and especially we... So what us have showed in the mice, and I'm really, really cautious uh, to transfer this data or translate this data into humans, and, and you make this crystal clear, especially if we're inducing a periimplant disease in that models, because we all know that it's a different mechanism than uh, the perimplantitis in, in, in the humans. But we did exactly this, what Asaf mentioned. Uh, we did proteomics from the tooth, from healthy tooth, and healthy implants and healthy uh, and diseased implants in the same uh, oral cavity in humans, and we show different proteome profiles. So what you mentioned, uh, we see on the proteome level as well. So there is another immune response on the protein level, we can say this. On the Be cell level, we cannot uh, show it. Between teeth and implants. Correct. In the same human beings, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to, make, uh, to answer one question from the audience, any human studies used to resolve around implants? No. I didn't get the second uh, part of the Is there any human study used on resolving around implants? Resolving around Not implants? No, that I know of. Okay, no. So we under that one. Yeah, I would also like to add a question. Um, because you were looking very much on patients who are already diseased. But based on your experience, you also had data on um, the naive uh, mice, or you also looked at patients who were not yet diseased. Is there also a chance before you 
um, insert the implant to get an information if this patient will be more susceptible to pure implant diseases? Shall I start? Or that it? would be the million dollar question. <laughs> 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 I don't think that anyone could uh, predict uh, except a periodontal patient who will have more perimplantitis and who will not at this stage. Taking or leaving out periodontal patients, as we know. So, in my opinion, not yet. Uh, so there are genetic studies. You know, we know all the polymorphisms of interleukins, so that's not clear, so we cannot use this. So for proteomics, we are the second study. Esberg published it, but for therapy, so no evidence. And on microbiome data, you are the experts, but I don't know any test where we can use the microbiota in advance to say, okay, this patient is susceptible, more susceptible or not. But, yeah. No, and, and when it comes to biomarkers, biomarkers are excellent, but you will never have a biomarker that's 100%. Yeah. And Different the, coffee the, machines. The, uh, yeah, and the, there's a big risk that biomarkers will only confuse the clinicians and the patients mm -hmm. if they're not very, and very, very good. Another question from the audience for, was, is there a difference because of titanium used? You used titanium, you, you looked at Both. ceramic implant mm -hmm. as well, so <coughs> is there a difference? Well, uh, <coughs> I just talked to Tobias about it. We actually started uh, a new project in which we compare titanium to zirconia implants in mice. And I could tell you that there is, or there are differences between these two materials. Major in, difference. In terms of immune response. <coughs> and and, and, you did and we, we, we discussed that before. Yeah. So our study in humans on the late state of the disease didn't show any differences on the material level, but on the personal level. But this is on the late stage. <laughs> it's so funny because we, we have an ORF-funded study with Gerd Eagelhardt, I've seen him in the back, where we do exactly this. So it's an ongoing study. We recruited already 10 patients or so, where we look into ceramic and titanium implants and the proteome and the cytokines of the curricular fluid and want to measure exactly this in healthy and disease. But we have no answer yet. But it, this but is very interesting because we <coughs> see uh, under steady state conditions a difference in the immune response. So maybe when you test or uh, collect the tissues after the diseases exist, you don't find any differences, but the starting point is different, and this might be interesting. But the late stage is, there's no difference. Yeah, on, on our data, this is the only study I know. I think no one else published on that, and it's a small uh, study cohort because so ceramic peri-implant disease is still like liquid gold. No one has so much samples because it's so seldom placed. Yeah. And, um, but to fix it, the end point, there's no difference between titanium and, and ceramic. Correct. And for the beginning, beginning, we do not know yet. Correct. Okay. Um, there is one good study of Ronnie Young's group. Uh, mm -hmm. They did an experimental mucositis um, of ceramic and titanium implants. And even on that stage, it was induced without not brushing their teeth and they obtained some histological samples before they restored the crowns on the implants. It's a really nice study, and they showed not a big difference on the histological level in induced mucositis. It's interesting, so it's more into our direction, but we will see immunology is it's complex and big, yeah. Another very interesting part you pointed out all this, uh, antibiotics. Now, if Antibiotics is sometimes a major uh, treatment option in periodontists, but in implantology, it quite seemed to be a, a, a difference. Could you explain that? Uh, I mean, uh, using antibiotics is uh, a little bit like pushing the problem in front of you. Uh, the microbiome will re-establish uh, re on, on the implant surfaces. So, and the, you have to combine it with a, with a successful treatment. And then it, 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 uh, it may be beneficial, as many studies have shown. And what's with the concentration, if we just give it orally or, or by infusion? Uh, do we get really the, the concentration to the, to the hotspot? I mean, that depends on uh, your success of treatment. You need to get, r to get rid of, of the biofilm in order to actually have a successful treatment with antibiotics. Otherwise, the concentrations that we use are, are too low, and we don't want to use higher concentrations than that. Mm -hmm. 
You agree? Uh, yeah, completely. And you know, even if you'll succeed to sterilize the surface of the implants, in a few weeks the uh, biofilm will return. Yeah. So reestablish. Yeah. And 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 the mode of of administering the the antibiotics does not make a difference. So the local uh, treatment. I mean, it would be great if we would have a local treatment that worked really well, but as of now, we do not really have that. I mean, I showed the, just to give an example of administration mode, this healing abutment that actually was a was study very where, where, yeah. where, where, where they put in uh, antibiotics in the healing abutments. Small study, but uh, still a very interesting way of administrating antibiotics because what we don't want is to have too much effect on the gut microbiome so that we would have to take probiotics for your diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the EFP has published uh, the guidelines showing that uh, local antibiotics uh, are not having any... The EFP, but for perimplantitis? For perimplantitis, yeah. And, but we got another look now at, at, at implants, or deeper insight into implants, so does this change? I want to fix that. Does your research have an impact on daily treatment? On treating implants? Yes, peri implant. Well, <laughs> actually, <laughs> when I when I when I listened to your presentation, I got, oh my God, we are placing <laughs> implants <laughs> and Disaster. we are you doing harm to the neighboring te teeth. Yeah. So, uh, what are we doing here? So again, it's Blow up it's implants. in mice. Okay, <laughs> again, it's in, in, in mice. But implants, uh, in mice at least, they cause uh, bacterial dysbiosis, which could affect uh, their oral cavity. But I think that uh, treating implants, like the surface of the implants, would not uh, help at the end. What wouldn't help? Will not, will not help to treat the disease in the long term. And, and did you look at the timeline? So perhaps it could be that initially placing the implants will harm the body itself. You make a, a, a stress to the animals and you have we know that operating an animal is such a big threat that you break down immunity. So is this related to some kind of time-dependent uh, observation? Or, or if we have some time, for instance, corresponding to a year function in humans, which is, I, I'm not quite sure, but six to seven, eight weeks? Then uh, up to 10 weeks, yeah. Uh, did you look at this? So does, does, does this uh, cell shift remain to more normal again? No, we didn't follow the mice for uh, more than 10 weeks, and you're right. right. Uh, probably we'll find something else in uh, a year. Or a year is a long for a mouse, but, uh, a mouse, but uh, mm -hmm. if we'll wait a few months, maybe we'll find something else. Yeah, I also have one question for you, Tobias. You showed many very promising and interesting techniques, but for example, next generation sequencing is super expensive. So how would you think um, the improvement to identify patients that are with a specific um, yeah, genetic or immunological reaction, how can they be detected in the private practice? Um, yeah. and which technologies are available for the future. So, so uh, two points on that. So first of all, all the, uh, the technique I showed, like proteomics to dis, uh, dis, uh, define the proteins or microbiome analysis or genetic genomics was expensive 20 years ago. So for instance, if we are remembering the G Human Genome Project cost, I think, 3 billion US dollars to sequence one of a uh, human genome. Now to do a genome analysis is maybe 300 bucks. So we can buy it already in 23andMe in US. Everyone can buy it as a normal customer. There are problems with that and that data stuff and so on. So this is the same for all the omics and the ne next um, generation sequencing. So it will be so cheap that we can do it on a daily basis. Part one. Part two. Sure, I think it's not for the private office yet. Uh, we wanted to do the step into uh, precision medicine, and um, yeah, we are working on it to get it into practice. Another question from the audience was that, is there any difference between the polish color around implants and rough surface? Stressing the surface. 
Can you give us uh, So uh, we didn't look at that. Uh, what we did is we, we published a study that was on cytokines with a laser lock surface, so where we are changing the surfaces and we see differences in the, in the cytokines, what makes sense, and, and you, you showed it as well, but I cannot answer this question with, with my techniques because we didn't do it. Yeah. I, I guess in terms of microbiota and biofilm, it will uh, cause a change. Mm -hmm. It changed. I mean, it could be a matter of uh, retention of, of, of the biofilm as, as well, uh, that we know very well. And um, that's why uh, um, uh, implantoplasty seems, seems to actually work, even though you spread uh, in parts of particle, implant particles in the tissues. Now, I want to dig into that. Uh, if you go for treatment of preimplantitis, we sometimes remove the surface of the, of the implants. So we placing around a, a lot of titanium particles into the soft tissue. We know this increased immune response. Yeah. Did you look at that? Did we harm the patient more than we, than we, than we do them better treatment? Well, the <laughs> human studies about implantoplasty shows like controversial, uh, Frank Schwartz shows some results and others shows other results, and I think the guidelines uh, relate to it uh, as well. But if I, I were a mice, if I was a mice, I didn't want uh, <laughs> that someone will do implantoplasty in Good. mine because of the titanium spreading. You wouldn't do that no. in your mouse, you? No. Uh, I was very much an opponent of uh, implantoplasty because, from a biological standpoint, it didn't really to spread the implant uh, particles in, in, in the soft tissue. Uh, and uh, there's, there's research from, from the Umeo group uh, as well that's showing that uh, um, titanium particles, especially together with LPS, is uh, inflaming the, the inflammation mm -hmm. even more. But, but on the other side, we have titanium particles in the body without any implant. Yes, yeah, so for, so, for so some reason, uh, I mean, I do it sometimes in the clinic, and uh, luckily it seems to work pretty well. But so it's, you're it's, against, it's, it's you do it sometimes, and you? Yes, so I want to make some points on that. So in Freiburg, we are not, we are not doing an implantoplasty. Um, so there is not good evidence that the particles we are releasing out of the implants during the implantoplasty is causing harm. We did this in the German guideline. I was responsible with Frank Schwartz on that and Ausra. So we, we have not got evidence on that. There are in vitro studies, and especially for ceramic particles as well, uh, that they can induce a pro-inflammatory response. So no uh, difference between titanium and ceramic. There, there are differences, but it's not just the material. There are so many other physical factors, like the shape of the particles, the polarization, the geometry, uh, even titanium has different I faces, see. and we showed that, Anastase, rutile form. There's so much more uh, basic science on that. So, but coming to that, we are not doing it for that. We don't want to cause the particle release, and we are uh, changing the geometry of the entire implant. So we are reducing the diameter, we are using the biomechanics, and so that's why we are not doing it a lot. Or but but mm -hmm. keeping the implants for some years more it helps, would help? Even to to if keep you, them if in the oral the cavity, that helps, yep. Yeah. When, when the option is to actually remove the implant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so that, so, on, so we are here, we are, we are showing the future. So we are showing how we have to treat our patient we in the near future. We want to know the future. We want to and have you here to know the future. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I think that we don't get into this trouble anymore to this late stage of the disease. So that, I think that is our research trying to, to show. And the implantoplasty is like um, getting, yeah, getting uh, or, or trouble with that and try to maintain the implant as long as possible, but we want to get earlier uh, on a certain point, yeah. And, and, and would you, we have to end up, sorry, but, mm -hmm. but would, you, would you shift the explantation more to the beginning of the treatment of pre-implantitis? When you look at your, your speeches, I'm guessing, oh, we're just um, uh, provoking the, 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 mm -hmm. the inflammatory disease and it's better because we might harm the other teeth, so it's better to remove the implant more, in more earlier stage? I mean, it's, it's as I showed at the beginning of my presentation, it's simple to say that you should remove the implant. <laughs> so <laughs> when you're sitting in the clinic, 
and the, 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 the option is to have this 80-year-old woman with no teeth and a full denture, then uh, you're not that cocky when it comes to removing the Yeah, implant. and we cannot base a decision on, on one mouse, my study, uh, so that's not good. And, um, and so we cannot remove the implants because we've seen in a mouse bone loss on the other teeth, so um, I deny that. And so, we, and our, and so implants are function really, really well. So, and, um, and, and we don't have any evidence that, that this kind of inflammation has a systemic outcome or so. So that's why keep the implants as long as possible, do an anti-effective therapy if you have a local inflammation over there. Um, yeah. So to summarize, and, and thanks a lot, you guys. You did a really great presentation. It was a lot of gain of information for us and, and, and a glance into the future. But uh, to end up, right now, we could stick to the recommendations of the guidelines. So to summarize, we've got a glance into the future. We know what you guys are, are searching for, and this is a very interesting part, but right now we should stick a little bit to the, to the proved concept of the guidelines. Yeah. Maybe one final statement, if you could look into the future. What do you think, what would we say in 10 years regarding the questions that were raised during the session? Uh, where are we going to be in 10 years? What do you think? I think that... Uh, Growing teeth, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I think that the future lies in, uh, like, growing teeth, not uh, placing implants. And there are some research uh, done about it, like uh, with uh, teeth buds and implanted in mice and rats that I know. Uh, for sure, it's not lies in uh, titanium. I think that in a shorter future, uh, and I hope, we will have an additional treatment of perimplantitis that's more directed towards the immunological response. Mm -hmm. That's really what I believe. Uh, and it makes so much sense. It doesn't make sense to put, to use, I don't think that antibiotics is the future, really. I think that more an Im this immunological and modulatory. This is a very, very important statement. I, I, I completely think. agree. I agree with that, and it will be more personalized. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Definitely. Thank you, guys. This is a really good statement. Very thank much. You. And thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you. to the audience.